And now without any further delay, I would like to turn today's event over to your moderator, Steve Barclay, Director, Global Standards Development for ADIS. Steve, you have the floor. Great. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation on earthquake early warning system notification, uh, leveraging the power of the commercial cellular network. Uh, for those who registered for this event, uh, an email will be distributed uh, following the meeting uh, for the link to the PDF version of the presentation as well as the uh, uh, recorded version of this presentation. Um, as was mentioned, I'm Steve Barclay, Addison's Director of Global Fitness Development and will serve for the moderator, as the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with ADIS, we are a technology and solutions development organization with nearly 200 companies actively participating in industry forums, and ADIS brings together the top global ICT companies to advance the industry's most pressing business priorities. During today's discussion, I encourage you to submit any questions that you may have online. Uh, we'll try to uh, hold the questions until the end of the presentations, and we'll try to get to as many of the questions as possible. You can view the agenda for today's webinar on the screen, and as you view the topics, I would like to introduce our speakers. Uh, our speakers will provide details regarding the California Earthquake Early Warning System, as well as added the feasibility study findings, which evaluated the techniques to distribute er early earthquake warning notifications to the general public by the cellular network as a way to complement the California Integrated Seismic Network. Our presenters today are Mark Johnson. Uh, Mark is the Branch Chief of the Earthquake and Tsunami Preparedness Program for the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Mark and his staff work with government agencies, educational institutions, voluntary organizations, and the private sector to promote earthquake and tsunami preparedness throughout the state. Uh, Brian Daly, who is the Director for Core Network and Government Regulatory Standards at AT&T, where he manages the Strategic Standards Engineering Team focusing on 4G LTE Evolved Packet and IT Multimedia Subsystem. NFE, SDN, fab security, small cells, machine to machine, regulatory topics including wireless emergency alerts, SMS and MMS to 911, and NG911, Silvan handsets, public safety broadband, and the PSTN transition. And Dr. Farouk Katibi. Uh, Farouk is the director of engineering for Qualcomm, where he started in 1990 to help design and build the first CDMA forward link cell demodulator system. In 92, he started a research project which led to Qualcomm's commercial packet-based infrastructure. Uh, Dr. TV is a member of Qualcomm's standards and industry organizations, where he also currently leads their ADIS activities. Mark, Brian, and Farouk, thank you for joining us today. And at this time, I'd like to ask Mark to launch our webinar by providing the background goals and objectives for a California earthquake early warning system. Mark, turn it over to you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, the Governor's Office of Emergency Services has been tasked uh, by uh, Senate Bill 135 uh, to develop a comprehensive statewide earthquake early warning system in California through a public-private partnership. Uh, part of that legislation uh, requested that we identify funding sources by January 2016. Uh, however, we must not specify general fund as a funding source, uh, and that legislation was approved as Government Code Section 8587.8 on September uh, 24, 2013. Uh, next slide, please. The, there's also current legislation, Senate Bill 494, sponsored by Senator uh, Jerry Hill, uh, which would, if it is passed, uh, create an earthquake uh, a safety fund uh, if funding is allocated, uh, require appropriated funding to be used for seismic safety, uh, earthquake-related programs, earthquake early warning, and uh, it would also, the legislation would also allow or authorize the fund to accept external funds uh, from other contributions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you see on your screen a chart uh, about earthquake early warning, and you can see uh, this particular uh, chart is the Southern San Andreas Fault and you'll see the Salton Sea, and uh, assuming a scenario where there's an epicenter on the Salton Sea, and I'm going to ask uh, to click the next slide so you can see the animation. And you'll see a P wave and an S wave that are generated off of the epicenter, mm -hmm. and uh, essentially the way that earthquake early warning will work is to measure the time and distance between that primary wave and that secondary wave, uh, and that's how, in concept, uh, earthquake early warning uh, will occur as based on the differences between the two. Next slide, please. 
where we are today, if you look at the goal uh, on slide seven, uh, we are looking at uh, the existing system is the California Integrated Seismic Network, uh, which identifies location, magnitude, and ground shaking, and will generate a shake map within five to ten minutes. This is a very beneficial tool for uh, emergency responders, uh, decision makers, and analysts who are looking at the data. Where we want to be, next slide please, is to provide advanced notification tens of seconds uh, before the shaking occurs. Uh, obviously that depends on your proximity uh, to the epicenter. Uh, the advantage is it would allow uh, people to move into safe areas, uh, perhaps to slow or stop equipment or trains, uh, to isolate hazards uh, such as chemicals and equipment. So there are many benefits to having that early notification. Next slide, please. So on slide eight, uh, you'll see a graphic of where earthquake early warning is used. And you'll, if you'll, next slide once, you'll see where systems are under development uh, in Italy, in Greece, in India. Uh, next slide. You'll see operational systems in Romania, Turkey, Taiwan, Japan, and Mexico. Next slide, please. And you'll see the demonstration system, which is currently in development and being tested in California. Uh, this is based on the existing uh, CISN shake alert model. And we'll talk a little bit more in just a minute about that. So we'll go to slide nine. So we see the, the general benefits of earthquake early warning. Uh, it would support hazard mitigation. Uh, it would promote safer environments. Investment can be cost effective, could result in lower insurance rates, and individual efforts can contribute to a statewide system if we are sharing data as part of a public-private system. Uh, next slide. Slide 10, here's some uh, examples of specific benefits. This is the uh, first blush look at uh, where early warning uh, could be used and leveraged. Obviously, as time goes by, we will recognize many more opportunities and benefits. But if you look at that list, uh, we mentioned a couple of general public, uh, the motoring public, uh, businesses, uh, fire station doors, how industry could use it. Uh, how utilities could use uh, the technology and transportation systems. Next slide, please. On slide 11, there are some limitations, uh, and these are the challenges that we face with developing this system, and with any new technology, there's always challenges. Uh, in California, there are many variables uh, due to the uh, many faults uh, and infrequent events that we have within the state. Uh, there are blind zones where there's limited sensor coverage. Uh, there could be the possibility of missed events uh, because the data was not received for some reason. Uh, there's a possibility of false alarms, which would result in negative reporting. So we need to have a, a very a high sense of reliability uh, that the system is going to be uh, beneficial uh, as we roll it out to the public. One of the other dynamics is in very large earthquakes, uh, they rupture over a period of minutes rather than seconds. And the system needs to be dynamic enough to recognize uh, the rupture uh, and to send out the alarms accurately. Next slide, please. On slide 11, uh, challenges uh, with developing the system. Uh, number one is funding, obviously, with um, uh, Public and private funding will be required uh, to fully roll out the system. We need to have a, an authority in place on how to govern uh, the program. Uh, there needs to be enhanced seismic centers, uh, sensors throughout the state. Uh, we need to be coordinating multiple implementation plans because there are various agencies involved with the process, and so we need to make sure that uh, we're all in sync. Uh, we need to ensure we have that reliable reporting that I mentioned and we also uh, need to make sure that the system will allow for sustainment over the long run. The last one is probably the most important part of earthquake early warning, and that's to make sure that people are educated uh, to the concept and how to react appropriately. Uh, next slide, please. So the project scope, if you look at slide number 13 there, it shows uh, the inner circle. These are the features and functions. 
if you think about de describing the system, uh, uh, the features and functions would be everything about the technology of earthquake early warning. The performance requirements. So we would have to make sure that there is a standard set at all levels, uh, that all partners are recognizing and using those standards uh, for the performance. And how the system is managed and maintained, that would be the governance structure I mentioned. And then the public outreach, that would be the education and training, which all sums up to uh, the, the finances that would be required. Next slide, please. So slide 14, uh, we started out after Senate Bill 135 was established with uh, formulating or forming a steering committee of decision makers to look at the challenges ahead, to set objectives, uh, and to move the process forward. In order to do this, you'll see uh, there's many different groups, uh, many different uh, subject matter experts that need to be brought together. Uh, we formed committees which uh, reached out to the various uh, groups, uh, specialists, uh, to take a look at the challenge. And you'll see, for example, uh, on the right-hand side, as I mentioned, emphasizing training and education, uh, looking at developing the outreach message uh, and the delivery system. The management committee would be looking at how the system would be governed. Mm -hmm. uh, the standards committee looking at specifically uh, the seismic standards, and obviously this is much larger than just the seismic standards, especially when we talk about the telecommunications industry. Uh, the model committee would be looking at the system description and how the public and private entities would work together. Uh, and then the Funding Options Committee looking at all different avenues for providing that funding. Uh, next slide, please. So on slide 15, you'll see uh, we are building upon the existing system. We do not want to reinvent the wheel. We want to take advantage of the successes of the California Integrated Seismic Network, which is our primary tool for notifications, and that's one region of the nationwide ANSS. Uh, currently, CISN provides the detection, the magnitude, depth, location, and time within seconds, and then within 15 to 30 minutes, uh, we also receive worldwide earthquake uh, notifications. Next slide, please. And you'll see uh, on slide 16, uh, we're also going to be building up upon the shake alert, so I'll ask uh, to click next slide one more time. And you'll see that uh, this is part of the uh, shake alert demonstration model, which is currently being tested within the state. And at the bottom, you'll see the partner agencies that are involved uh, with developing shake alert, uh, USGS, Berkeley Seismological Lab, uh, Caltech, University of Washington, uh, ETH, Southern California Earthquake Center, and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Next slide, please. On slide 17, you'll see uh, the demonstration model sample. Uh, here's the prototype. Uh, when uh, earthquake notification is received, you'll receive a pop-up, uh, and the display will then provide a countdown and uh, the local shaking intensity, depending on where the uh, display is, is located. Next slide, please. Slide 18, you'll see an animation there. Uh, and this is the basic system description where you have all of the field sensors uh, hooked up to field telemetry, going to computer processors, and then the notification would go out uh, to the various end users. And the applications could be uh, via internet, uh, the shake alert demonstration model, or other applications. Uh, the public alert system, uh, uh, when that is automated and allows for uh, displaying and um, broadcasting earthquake early warnings. Wireless telecommunications, why we're here today, uh, regarding the message distribution on smartphone applications and other uses, and then data distribution. Next slide, please. The outreach and education, you'll see uh, the graphic there gives uh, different examples of how people should behave uh, or react when earthquake early warnings are issued. And you can see a variety of different scenarios, and then we would want to build on these scenarios 
uh, for the as part of the education program. Next slide, please. Slide 20, a little bit on the cost factors involved with earthquake early warning, uh, the initial construction cost, even though that we have the California integrated seismic network that needs to be enhanced. There will be uh, needed new and upgraded seismic stations, GPS stations, uh, significant uh, upgrades to field telemetry. Uh, there will be costs associated with the annual operation and maintenance, and obviously the staffing to support the system. Next slide, please. Our process um, will go out in development phases. We started out with a project charter to lay the ground rules. Uh, the committees put together their findings and recommendations. Uh, we are in the process of drafting an implementation plan, and that will be in general terms. And then once the implementation plan is approved by all of the parties, then each participating uh, agency would put together their own uh, individual work plans to meet their needs. Uh, next slide, please. So slide 22 is a implementation strategy concept. So we started out with creating the concept of earthquake early warning. We're really in the process of challenging all aspects uh, of that new concept and finding out uh, our strengths, the weaknesses, what we need to address. And then once you challenge it, it will raise many questions that will need to be clarified. Uh, we're also in that part of the process. And then once uh, the message is very clear, then we start communicating that to our key partners, and then it will cascade down to uh, our other partners and then out to the general public. So there's the concept for implementation. And then uh, there's also the concept of a life cycle uh, that needs to be included in the implementation plan, where at the top you acquire uh, the equipment and technology, uh, you utilize it uh, on a regular basis, you maintain the equipment, evaluate its effectiveness, and refresh or revise. So that's the life cycle that would be involved in the process. So those uh, are the, the key points of the California Earthquake Early Warning System, which is based on CISN and the Shake Alert demonstration model. And uh, you'll see on slide 24, uh, next steps. Uh, which is to schedule workshops. Uh, one is to uh, further coordinate with our CISN partners. Uh, today we're kicking off that telecommunications coordination with the private sector uh, at us. Uh, eventually we'll need to bring in all of the partners together to talk through uh, what the, the vision is versus what the capabilities are and work through the challenges that we all face. Uh, some of the other sectors uh, that we are actively working with, the utility sectors, uh, rail transportation, and others. And so there's many more meetings to follow today. Uh, this is obviously a good first step. Uh, we look forward to working with all the partners uh, on this project. Next slide, please. So with that, um, there's my contact information. If you'd like to email me directly, I know there will be questions that are generated today. We do have many of our CISN partners uh, listening in today, so as you ask questions, uh, we'll be able to uh, get those back to you uh, once I bounce them off of the subject matter experts. So with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Brian. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, at this point, I, I would like to talk about the ADIS feasibility study for early earthquake warning. Uh, as Mark mentioned, there's work going on in, in California uh, looking at more the seismic portion of, of, of the network. Uh, ADIS, uh, when uh, we learned of that work going on, uh, undertook a feasibility study to look at uh, notifications of these earthquake early warnings over cellular systems. Uh, this feasibility study uh, has been completed, and it was uh, designed to evaluate techniques to distribute these early earthquake warning notifications to the general public using cell phones, uh, two cell phones via the cellular network uh, to complement the seismic network that's being uh, deployed in California. And, and just some definitions, uh, an early earthquake warning notification uh, is a notification broadcasted by the cellular network to cell phones in a spe specified geographic area 
following the receipt of an indication from an earthquake early warning center that such a notification needs to be broadcast. And these notifications are going to contain limited information. It's, it's really designed to be an indication of imminent danger using a standard display of a short earthquake warning message, which is pre-configured pre in the cell phone. Um, Mark went through some of the earthquake early warning principles, but I just wanted to make sure we're all level set on, on the technology that's being used here. Uh, as he mentioned, there are two waves that are, in, that, uh, are initiated as a result of an earthquake. Uh, the first is what's known as the P wave, uh, and this travels at about three and a half miles a second. And then there's a slower S wave, and it's that S wave that causes most of the shaking and damage that, that's felt in the earthquake. And, and that travels about two miles per second. So what you've got is a, a time between the P wave and the S wave in order to get an early earthquake notification out. Uh, and, and this uh, is, is really, uh, you know, highly uncertain and provides a limited amount of warning time, but there is enough science there that it gives us a possibility for giving, you know, a matter of seconds, maybe up to a minute of warning time. Uh, it's, it's possible uh, to provide earthquake early warnings only when the notifications can be sent through the communication systems ahead of the seismic wave. And that shaking can take some seconds to minutes to travel from where the earthquake occurred to the area where you're broadcasting these notifications. Uh, and Mark mentioned the farther you are from the epicenter of the earthquake, the greater amount of possible warning time you have. And to maximize this warning time, the system has to be designed to minimize delays in, in the data processing, communication, and ultimately delivery of these earthquake early warnings. Now, the chart on the right-hand side of this slide shows the warning time uh, does depend on the distance to the quake. And there will be a blind zone in there where you will not be able to get the warning out in time to notify the citizens in that area just because the processing time and, and the time to communicate the information uh, is just not going to be able to you know, be, be done quick enough before the earthquake waves uh, come along. Uh, however, as you move out, you know, say beyond 20 miles from the epicenter, uh, then you have some warning time if, you're, uh, if, if your systems are, are quick enough to give the ability to give at least a few seconds to up to a minute warning uh, before the real uh, heavy shaking starts to occur. Uh, in a basic early earthquake warning system model, there's really four entities, and I think Mark touched on these again in his presentation. Uh, the first you have is the sensor networks, and these are the seismographs and other sensors that are really going to detect uh, the waves that come out from the earthquake. Uh, then you have the automated decision-making framework, and this is the processing that's needed to quickly estimate the earthquake's location, its magnitude, its fault rupture length, and, and to map the resulting intensity. Uh, next, you have the dissemination channel, uh, which for the case of this feasibility study is the cellular networks. Uh, and this is uh, the method that's used to provide quick and reliable mass notification. And, and again, earthquake early warning is possible only when the notifications can be sent through the communication systems ahead of the seismic wave. And then finally, you have the recipient, uh, and, and they take specific actions as a result of being notified. Some of the assumptions that were made during the feasibility study, uh, the first off is that uh, the standardization efforts will be applied to 4G LTE networks and received by new uh, early earthquake warning-enabled cell phones by, with a valid cellular subscription. So existing cell phones that are deployed out uh, in, in the U.S. today are not capable of receiving early earthquake notifications, and the design and capabilities of second-generation and third-generation wireless networks don't provide the functionality required to support the dissemination of earthquakes, uh, earthquake early warning notification messages required uh, within the sh uh, short time interval that's required in order to provide the notification. Uh, there's a standardization met, uh, phase that's required in order to standardize the data and message formats through the system, and especially the interface and protocol between the automated decision-making framework, uh, which uh, we, we've termed the Earthquake Alert Center in, in the feasibility study, and the cellular network infrastructure. 
And because these messages are time sensitive in nature, uh, new early earthquake warning cell phones will be required uh, to receive these notifications as quickly as technically feasible. And given the nature of wireless networks and radio propagation, there's no guarantee that the cell phone will receive the notification in a timely manner. And in some cases, they may not receive the notification at all. Uh, it's assumed that, that the earthquake early warning broadcast will typically, typically occur within 20 seconds after the notification is received from the earthquake alert center and is received by the cellular network. Uh, and in order to meet these time-sensitive requirements, the solution has to assume the reuse of existing capabilities on the LTE broadcast channel. The notification area is assumed to be a circle specified by the estimate, estimated surface location of the epicenter and an associated radius where the early earthquake warning should be broadcast. And the chart on the, on the right-hand side of this slide uh, shows the notification area being that circle of a certain radius out of the epicenter, uh, estimated epicenter, and then also highlighted that you do have a blind zone where uh, the, between the processing and the ability to broadcast the message out, uh, it, it just won't be able to uh, go fast enough before the earthquake waves do come about. Uh, the cellular networks will make the best approximation to map the uh, notification area to the associated set of cell sites which are broadcast in the notification area. So the operator uh, network will look at what cell sites are in that circle and then broadcast the notification out uh, using those cell sites. So now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Farouk uh, for more detailed technical analysis. Thanks, Brian. So in this section, I would like to explain how we are planning to use cellular network uh, to uh, broadcast the alert messages. Um, and, and I'm going to go a little bit on the technical aspects, and I know some of you um, already know these details very well, so uh, I may bore some of you, and some of you may be the first time you're hearing it. But what I would like to do is start with some basic concepts so that we understand uh, some of the terminology that we use in telecommunication so that we understand it. The first basic concept is cell broadcast. So what that, what is that? So I'm, on the picture on the left, I'm showing how communication can be done point to point. Point to point communication examples are SMS. So when you receive an SMS message, it is directly uh, going to your phone because of your phone number. And or, for example, you can have an application that some message can be pushed to your application. But those are point-to-point -point communication in the way that uh, you have to either have your um, uh, cell phone number registered in some database to get the SMS and or, for example, you have to have an application that would receive the specific messages. They work, the problem is, there are a number of problems that I'm going to list the problems further out in the next slide, but one of the issues is that if you look at the red phone on the left side, if that is, a, for example, a roamer coming to your area and it's not registered with that service, it will not receive that warning. Or alternatively, if that phone uh, is registered in your service and goes to another state, another country, they would still receive that message. So it's a, not a perfect situation. And the other major problem that I will describe later is that uh, you know, when you have an emergency system and you want to send messages to millions of uh, devices, that really blocks down the network and it causes pro potential problems with the network. And that's when you really want your network to work fine, and that's an issue that we need to resolve. Now, what is a cell broadcast? That is the concept that we are showing on the right side. And that is it's just like what we do for TV broadcast. You transmit it once, and all the devices that are within the range of receiving that message will get the message. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be subscribed to it. Uh, you will receive it as long as, as Brian mentioned, as long as your device is enabled with that uh, service, with the early earthquake warning service, you will receive that message. And if you're roaming in, you will still receive it. If you're roaming out and you're not within the danger area, you will not receive that message. 
what are the advantages? So, and some analysis of point-to-point -point, point communication. Uh, you know, SMS, it, they are never designed for critical real-time uh, communication. You know, especially if the system is loaded, SMS messages are going to be queued and potentially you may never even receive it or you, see, you receive it in a, uh, after a long period of time. Um, I, so significant delivery delays are possible when there are a lot of messages need to be sent in the case of, for example, an earthquake. Um, and the messages are addressed to your phone number or to your device specifically. Um, therefore, you need to be uh, putting your phone in that, uh, in that specific database and or having an application registered. And as we discussed, you know, when you're doing roaming, that is not practical. Also, um, SMS doesn't have any security aspects. Um, as a matter of fact, you can go on a website and start sending a bunch of SMSs to everyone without any checking on who is the authorities are sending it. So in the case of emergency, when you really need to have some um, uh, authority on what's going on, SMS, for example, does not work at all. With respect to some smartphone apps that sometimes are being discussed to be able to receive messages, I, there, first of all, you need to have a data subscription, and not all devices will have data subscription. And second is that, you know, it's, it's, it, it, every time that you're transmitting information to one of these applications, it requires some data bandwidth that if you add up, in the case of emergency, to a large number of devices that have to receive that uh, service, emergency service, in a very specific time, that just overloads the network, and sometimes it just crashes the network, so sometimes it, the network will just prevent it from happening. So all these point-to-point uh, problems uh, really make it that, that you really shouldn't use point-to-point, -point and you should really consider broadcast technology. So um, the next concept that I would like to share, because you know we're going to talk about this thing, and I think Brian mentioned a little bit, is the concept of geotargeting. What does that mean? So I'm showing a network, a couple of networks. Now let's say that uh, we want to transmit um, a message to a specific alert area. Now that alert area, for example, can be at Polygon, or in the case of um, early earthquake warning, as Brian mentioned, we are going to consider only circle. And you can have it either way, but what the magic that telecommunication would allow you to do is that it would allow transmission to specific cell sites that are within the range of that alert area. So that yet those yellow cell sites are the ones that are receiving the message and they're broadcasting the alerts to the users in those areas. All the other users will not receive that because they are not in the alert area. So for example, if I'm in San Diego um, and there's an earthquake in nearby and I'm in the alert area, I will receive it. But if I'm traveling and I'm not in the um, affected area, I will not receive that alert. So it's very based on lo your localization more than on subscription, which is what really, if you think about it, emergency, earthquake emergency is all about. So now I'm going to talk about our potential solution based on what I just described. Um, so let's say that there is an earthquake happens, and uh, both Mark and Brian discuss the process of detecting it. But what beyond the detection is that the earthquake alert center will send a message to the um, CMSP, the cellular mobile uh, service provider network. And then based on geotargeting, the CMSP can then transmit um, broadcast messages to the affected area using broadcast technology. And since this is done very efficiently and the, uh, we have techniques to do it, we can do it within 20 seconds. Um, to save lives versus if you do it point to point and you have to queue a lot of devices and you know especially SMS and or application this could take a long time because it, once you queue them up you never know when it's going to get there and or how long it would take to get there. Now there is a system already existing in the 
um, in the U.S. and other countries. Um, sometimes we refer to it as CMS, but now the new name for it is RIA, Wireless um, um, Emergency Alert. You might have received messages from it, for example, whenever there is a thunderstorm or there's something, if you have that activated on your device, you may get a, like a tornado warning or thunderstorm warning or something like that. So uh, you might have seen something like that that, uh, that uh, it, it, it enables you to see what's going on. Um, there is an issue with this thing. Uh, and let's just go through the example. Let's say that you're having um, uh, an earthquake. In the existing VR system, that message has to go through what we call a federal alert aggregator. And that federal alert aggregator has to combine that message with messages from other agencies, for example, federal agencies, state, locality, and so forth. And that path introduces additional delay that is not acceptable for a very quick earthquake warning message when, you know, seconds could mean uh, millions of life savings. So if in that case now the uh, broadcast starts, um, then you potentially can have uh, a minutes of delay and that is not acceptable for a case such as um, uh, earthquake warning. So VO is designed to be uh, for a, a imminent threat alert, but not for time sensitive alerts. But potentially we can use VO uh, to uh, provide enhanced information. For example, once you transmit their warning immediately, if you want to send some additional information, uh, you can use uh, VO to send additional details on what should be done later on. And again, that would be done in a broadcast me me method that would use the network, the cellular network, very efficiently. Um, and Mark mentioned uh, this map. I'm uh, kind of showing this similar map that there are earthquake warnings around the world. But the reason I'm bringing it up again is that not not the systems are not currently, not all of them are using cellular network to transmit the information to the affected areas, to the affected devices at very close to time. The one system that's actually, you know, Japan being one of those areas where um, the, the earthquake and tsunamis are very important to it and they are very critical. There is a system using cellular network and it's called ETWS, Earthquake and Tsunami Warning Service, that um, it is, again, standardized, um, available in the device. And when we say standardized, I think um, Brian's going to discuss it a little bit more. It's critical for it to be standardized because then it will be in, available in all devices, all the new devices, and there will be interoperability. So this ETWS in Japan was standardized and um, they, they now a lot of devices in, the, in, in Japan, they have that technology, and that means that it's used quite a bit uh, in Japan now to transmit information uh, with respect to earthquake and tsunami warning. With that, I'm going to hand it back to Brian. Okay, thank you, Farouk. Uh, at this point, I'd like to go to some of the conclusions and next steps for the uh, earthquake early warning system feasibility study. So as a result of this study, ADIS did determine that cellular wireless broadcast notifications is a viable concept uh, designed with the constraints and limitations of the cellular wireless network. Uh, the study did look at a proposed architecture for the system uh, for the distribution of time-sensitive notifications using the capabilities in the LTE broadcast channel. Uh, and, and again, if, if we go back to that example Mark had provided earlier in this presentation, um, a lower San Andreas fault rupture, uh, and, and, and if you looked at where the propagation of that PNS wave that was headed right for the LA basin, uh, so we're talking about millions, if not tens of millions of, of users that need to receive messages in seconds to minutes. And, and really broadcast is, is the only technology that has the potential to reach millions of users in, in that time frame uh, in an inherently geotargeted fashion. 
Uh, if you try to do that, as, as Farouk mentioned, using traditional SMS or apps on, on smartphones, uh, it, it's only going to swamp the network, slowing the delivery of EEW notifications to a crawl. So, so the broadcast technology that's available uh, within the LTE uh, system uh, is, is really what needs to be built upon in order to provide this capability. Uh, so next step uh, is looking at standards. Uh, once there's agreement by all stakeholders to proceed into the standardization phase, uh, ADIS uh, will develop new standards to specify the relevant interfaces and protocols for an end-to-end -end system. And when we look at the end-to-end -end system uh, from, from the uh, dissemination point, uh, we need to start from the earthquake alert center all the way to the broadcast to the cell phone that will notify the users of the imminent earthquake. Uh, we also need to look at uh, aspects of system security and engineering, alert messages and distribution, and overall system performance for the earthquake early warning system. And this includes collaboration in the development of standards for the maximum allowable telemetry latencies and minimum quality of service for data uh, sources so that we can develop an end-to-end -end latency budget uh, and define that from an end-user perspective. Uh, as Farouk mentioned, another important aspect, uh, as you have visitors traveling to California, uh, which is a, a popular uh, international tourist destination, uh, you want to make sure that you have the ability to, to uh, that those uh, inbound roamers will also receive the alerts uh, when they're visiting into the state. So bringing uh, the standards into the global 3GPP public warning system standards uh, will give us global consistency and also facilitate early earthquake notifications uh, for international roamers, but also for domestic roamers. Uh, this, you know, would be supported in handsets not only uh, that are in California, uh, but also throughout the U.S. Uh, as far as timelines, uh, if, uh, that during the feasibility study, we uh, estimated that it will take approximately three to four years to develop and deploy uh, the standards, uh, updating the cellular operators' networks uh, to support those standards and capabilities, uh, designing new cell phones that can receive early earthquake warning notifications, uh, educating the public on the new service, and begin introducing cell phones that support this alerting, and as well as deploying the interfaces to the Earthquake Alert Center. Uh, close collaboration is going to be required between all stakeholders involved in the design of the end-to-end -end system. That includes the USGS, uh, the CISN, the California Integrated Seismic Network, ADIS, the cellular network operators, as well as other relevant parties uh, to ensure successful and timely standardization, planning, development, testing, and deployment of the system. And this duration would start once the deployment plan and budget for the sensor network and automated decision-making framework for the system has been approved. Uh, it, it's also estimated it will take five to seven years before a substantial number of cellular uh, network users will have the capabilities on their devices. And this, again, is uh, through normal uh, uh, subscribers replacing their cell phones and upgrading their cell phones. Uh, if, if, as we go into global 3GPP standards, uh, this may increase the timeline in order to align with global standard release schedules as well. So let me uh, now turn it back to Steve. Uh, Steve, I'll let you explain how to get the feasibility study. Okay, thank you, Brian. And also thanks to uh, Farouk and Mark for all the, all the great information during the presentation today. Uh, we do have a number of questions that have come in, so we will get to those momentarily. Uh, on, the, on the screen is the link for the feasibility study. Uh, if you can download that uh, at no charge. Uh, that's available on the website. Uh, it will also, of course, be in the link that gets sent out after the meeting. Uh, so I will, I will leave this on the screen for, for just a moment. And um, what we will do what we'll do now is we will move into the questions, and we have a number of them, so if you can, if you can bear with me for just a moment uh, as we have them sorted. Uh, so the first one would go to Baruch. Uh, there's a question on, could the cell service also grab a local weather radio emergency broadcast to increase coverage despite where the person is and not based on any subscription? 
Okay, so uh, first of all, we, we don't need any subscription for this, this service that you're describing using cellular networks. So, uh, so we, there's no subscription needed. As long as you're in the affected area, you will receive it. Uh, now, with respect to the question of can we use uh, local weather radio, we are still designing the network. At this point, we actually want to get the information directly from the, um, the from the earthquake center instead of getting it from local weather. So at this point, our concept has been to get the information from authorities and then use the cellular network to broadcast it, not from local weather network, etc. Uh, we can definitely consider that, but that is not one of our plans. Brian, did you want to add something? Uh, no, I, I think the only other uh, consideration is, you know, there, there isn't a weather radio receiver within mobile devices, and, you know, the, the challenges would be to, to incorporate that in and integrate it into the, the LTE system. The, the broadcast mechanisms that are proposed here in the feasibility study are directly integrated within the cellular network and provide the, the best way of getting the messages out uh, in a short period. Thank you. Okay, Steve. great. Thank you. Uh, and we have a, a number more. We have about nine minutes for Q and A, so we will we will go through uh, as many as we can. And, and if there are any questions that we have that we're not quite sure what the question may be, we'll 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 seek back what maybe some clarification, um, or we'll also take them offline. Uh, Brian, uh, in, in, this was in your presentation, I believe. Um, how can we reduce the 20-second delay before a warning is issued, uh, as it seems like it's a, a, a bit of a long time? Um, well, there's a number of steps that have to be taken once the notification is received from the Earthquake Warning Center. Uh, we have to figure out which area it needs to be broadcast to, what cell sites are within those areas. So the, the 20 second uh, interval is, is an estimate of the time that it will take uh, to, to complete all those steps and, and begin the broadcast out and then, you know, for the phones to receive them. Um, certainly as we go through the, the, the standardization phases, we will try to refine that number and, and minimize it as much as possible uh, using, you know, whatever is available to us. But, uh, you know, at this feasibility stage, really, that's, that's the best estimate we could come up with at this point uh, until we go through the end and latency uh, uh, considerations. Um, you know, we, we, we don't have a, a, a better number at this point. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And the next question is actually back to Farouk. Uh, I believe the Japanese system delivers the P wave warning immediately without human intervention. Uh, it is keyed on the detection of the wave. Uh, are we proposing to add this capability to the WIA system in the U.S.? So, so that's a good question. Uh, let me make a clarification. So, uh, you know, the Japanese system is one model that we are considering as a basis for our design. We are not going to, you know, California, the United States, we have our own requirements that we need to make sure that we would fulfill those requirements. But what we are doing is that we are looking at various systems that are being deployed, including the Japan, Japan ETWS, and learning what works and what needs to be enhanced. So we are considering, yeah, maybe we can do the pivot directly, but there may be better ways to do it. So the answer to your question, the short answer is that we are considering all options at this point. Nothing's off the table, but we need to look at the requirements, look at the design, look at what is being deployed, and lesson, lesson learned from the Japanese system, and come up with our best system for uh, California and the United States. So we are going to study everything and come up with a system that best meets the requirements for U.S. Okay, thank you, Farouk. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another one that just came in. Uh, Brian, I think I'm going to target this to you. Um, any thoughts regarding utilizing mobile devices themselves as sensors to self-report accelerometer data? And that might be Brian or Farouk, but we'll see. Brian, if you have any initial thoughts. Yeah, yeah, let me let me start with that. I, I know there's been some articles and some research done on, on utilizing devices themselves. 
I, I mean, certainly that, that does pose challenges in, in authenticating the data and making sure that, um, you know, we, it, it, it's really good data. Um, I think there's a lot of study that would need to be done before device-based accelerometer, uh, you know, warning uh, is done. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, the, the sensor network approach that's being, uh, you know, proposed here, uh, modeling off of some other deployments like in Japan certainly uh, appears to be the most uh, uh, robust system, I, I think, at this point. Farouk, any, anything to add? No, I, I mean, we obviously we are doing all research on all fronts, but I, as Brian said right now, from the security aspect, from the, you know, technology, uh, I think that the, the, the system that's being proposed using the um, uh, shake alert, I think that's the best way to go and the most secure way to go. Okay, thank you both. We're gonna we're gonna throw one to Mark. Uh, Mark, uh, how much broader will the California Integrated Seismic Network deployment need to be expanded to provide for the requisite sensors needed to detect and process the initial P wave information uh, so that it can be broadcast to the users? Thank you. Uh, if you look at a current map of the seismic station locations, you'll see that they are uh, located densely around populated areas. Uh, and that was by design based on the fact we want to uh, try to protect the public in those areas. For earthquake early warning, uh, our uh, experts are saying that uh, we need a sensor density of about uh, 10 kilometers apart in urban areas and about 20 kilometers around active faults. And when possible, the sensors should be placed within five kilometers of an active fault, but not directly on that active fault. So you can see we have a long way to go. There are many existing CISN stations uh, that can be used. Approximately 400 of those stations are earthquake early warning capable, uh, and they're installed today. But uh, other uh, stations will be needed, and the early estimates were approximately 260 additional stations statewide. And that's uh, for minimal uh, coverage to achieve the target needs uh, of the system. So if we talk about the, uh, the density, uh, I cited uh, a few of the key examples we've been provided so far. And then uh, the, the, the rollout strategy uh, would have to be phased in. We would start out with the, the early adopters, uh, those people that are knowledgeable uh, and uh, add value uh, as we distributors. We would go to a broader group of general organizations. Uh, eventually, there would be a limited public uh, rollout to different venues. Uh, then we would have limited rollout to the general public, uh, geographical areas, and then finally uh, to the general public. So there has to be uh, a lot of thought put in on how we roll this out and when we roll it out and when it's ready. Great. Thank you, Mark, for all the, all the details. All right, we have a handful more questions. We only have a couple of minutes, and we'll try to get through them, and then uh, we can take any others offline as well. Uh, to Farouk, will the proposed solution from Addis support visitors to California, both domestic and internationally? So, so yeah, as, as, as we mentioned, it will support all the devices that have that uh, capability. So these are new devices that should have the capability for um, earthquake and uh, early earthquake warning. So part of the reason we are standardizing this thing is so that um, all the devices that the, all the new devices can have that. So the answer is that in the U U.S., as long as that those those devices have that capability, they will be able to receive them in the affected area. For the international roamers, as long as those devices have that capability, and we are planning to standardize this thing in the global platform such as 3GPP. So yes, the plan is to have the devices that have the capability, whether they are domestically or internationally roaming to California to receive those. Okay, great. Thank you, Farouk. Um, I believe we're out of time. We don't want to run over the scheduled time. Uh, I know there are a handful of other questions that have come in. Um, please feel free to reach out to us offline as well. Uh, the, uh, our information is on our website. You can also uh, get information when we send the uh, notification out regarding the availability of the, the, the webinar details. Um, 
we'll move to the last slide here. We do have uh, other uh, future webinars uh, always available on our website. Um, I'd first like to thank uh, Farouk, Brian, and Mark for uh, presenting and spending the time putting this uh, content together, uh, for answering the questions from the audience. Uh, what we'll do is any questions that we have we'll, that we didn't get to, we'll, we'll take offline. We'll try to work with you uh, to get information to you uh, and or to have you uh, get engaged in the future activities that we have taking place within within ADIS on the, the future standards activities. So uh, thank you very much to everybody and have a great day.